the opportunity we have to be together this morning. We thank you that we can be together in Jesus' name and, Lord, have the camaraderie that the world just can't comprehend. And I pray today as we open the Word of God, the Spirit of God would enlighten us, challenge our hearts. Certainly, if there be any, though, that are here in the service or watching by way of live stream that do not personally know you, that you would show them their need. Even those this morning that perhaps are not even uh, expecting you to speak to them, that you would arrest their heart and show them exactly where they stand. Work in our hearts, exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, and we thank you for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. In 2 Peter chapter 2, I want to read for the text beginning in verse 12. The Bible says, Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak evil against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to king as supreme, or as unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Now, we have for several weeks looked at the first part of First Peter, and almost every time, if not every time, we have brought up the text back in verse 9 that we are a chosen generation and a royal priesthood. We've seen the emphasis there that we are in Christ, that because He lives in us, we ought to live a holy life. He, in the first couple of chapters, emphasizes the fact that because we're a royal nation, that is a peculiar people, there ought to be a difference between the believer and the unbeliever. That is, there ought to be a difference between the person who knows the Lord Jesus Christ and the person who is ignorant. The difference is Christ in me. It is not from the outside working in, it is Jesus on the inside working out. Now, he does not really change that thought in chapter 2, but he gives us the practical accomplishment of that. It is not that we just live different just to be different. God is doing something. He is pursuing a lost world. And how is he doing that? But through his people. That is, Jesus lives in us, and he wants to reveal himself through the world. Now, I've used this text in chapter 2, verse 9 for this first section, but I want you to see again, because if we see where he's headed, it helps to see how this fits in. Look in chapter 3 for a moment. And notice this will culminate in verse 15. Everything he's going to deal with now in these verses, working up to verse 15 of chapter 3, is this point. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Does it not follow that if my life is different from the world, if Jesus in me begins to live outwardly and the world notices that, he says, be ready. Because undoubtedly what's going to happen is people are going to question why, why there is a difference. Now, yes, we have a responsibility to confront even those that don't ask the question. We look for opportunities to share the Lord Jesus, to, to give that message. But how much more effective the message when a person has already observed that there's something going on in your life? They've observed that there's a power, there's a grace, there's a difference. There is something about you that does not uh, respond the same way that the world responds. He says, be ready to give an answer because somebody's going to want to ask you about your hope. You know what the life of Jesus reveals to the world? It reveals that we have hope. Now, our responsibility is to do just that. Did you notice in our text in chapter 2 that it says, have your conversation honest among the Gentiles. Now, of course, as believers, we ought to be literally honest. That is, we ought not to be thieves and defrauding people. But the honesty here is not talking about just defrauding someone. The honesty is a literal honesty in the sense that what we show on the outside is actually true of us on the inside. You know, many people can put up a front, right? But if you're around someone long enough that's putting up a front, eventually you're going to realize that it's just a front. What the world can't explain, it's not that they're not going to see an error in your life and mine. It's not that they're not going to see us blow it sometimes. It's not that they're not going to notice there's a crack or a crevice. But when they see it, they're going to see something deeper than a front. Though we're real, we're honest. That is, it isn't us. It's the Lord working through us. Who does he want us to show it to? Well, he says the Gentiles. 
Many times in the Old Testament, when you think of Gentiles, it is a contrast to the Jew. But in the New Testament, when you see Gentile, it is the heathen. That is, those that are not in the family of God, those that may be familiar with it, but do not personally know Christ, we need to have a testimony to them. And how are we going to do it? We're going to do it with the well-doing, with the good works, that we may, in verse 15, silence the ignorance of foolish men. You see, we need a testimony to this world, and the way we do it is by promoting the Lord Jesus Christ by a holy life. I'm familiar with a, uh, a young person, a, a girl who had been rather sheltered in her life, grown up in a Christian school, went off to a Christian college, um, certainly knew what the world was, but had never really worked around it. She had an opportunity to, to get a job and immediately began to get immersed in what this world is all about. Not too long on the job, she's hearing conversations she's never heard. Being exposed to lifestyles that she knew existed, but had never actually known anyone like it. But again, as she uh, begins to be introduced to different people, she simply tries to live a testimony, do what's right. And when conversations come up, she speaks what she needs to speak. Well, you know, she wasn't long there before she found out one of her co-workers was uh, uh, living a, an immoral lifestyle and bragged about it. Another co-worker claimed to be a homosexual. Uh, another co-worker was clearly dishonest and had a rotten attitude. Well, you know, all of us work around that type of thing. Hopefully you think, well, you've got church staff. That wouldn't be the case. But anyway, we're around it, right? We work around those folks. I mean, we meet them at the store. We go to places. But you understand what happened in this particular case. It wasn't long before that testimony began to show. And somebody came to her within just a matter of time and said, why are you always happy? They wanted to know why. Another conversation comes up and she's just simply taking her stand, biblical principles that she understands, not really driving it down their throat. But it comes up some political issue and she's, of course, opposed to abortion. And the conversation comes up and someone sincerely says, I'd like to talk to you more about your beliefs. How do opportunities arise that way? Is it because one person has great eloquence and ability? It's because when Jesus Christ begins to show through a life the world scratches their head and says, what makes that person tick? Well, I'll tell you what makes us tick is the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the only thing that keeps Jesus from showing that way, and we emphasize that in the first couple of chapters, is we're, we see that when we get in the way ourselves. But now the practical part of that, and it culminates, and you'll see this in the end of this chapter, which really tells us how to accomplish it. I want you to notice simply how we're going to show Jesus today to the world. How are we going to silence the foolishness of ignorant men? I want you to see, first of all, our expectation. Now, we read this in the text, but let's go back and think about, look, if you would, in verse 11. Now, we finished our time two weeks ago on this verse, but notice it says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Now, I emphasized the abstain part a couple of weeks ago. Undoubtedly, you remember every detail of that. But uh, today, I want to emphasize the stranger and the pilgrim. You know what that is? That's our position in the world. You notice the stranger is first and the pilgrim is second. There's no mistaken words in the Bible. We are strangers first, then we're pilgrims. How does, why does that matter? Because first of all, as a stranger, I am separated from this world positionally. God called me as a believer when I received the Lord Jesus Christ. He placed me in his church. And we're talking about the actual church made up of all born-again believers. Not just the visible manifestation, though that's part of it, but the actual family of God, because I'm in him, I'm no longer connected to this world. I live in it, but I'm not of it. The Bible says in James 4.4, 4, it says, Friendship with the world is enmity with God. The Bible reminds us and exhorts us in Romans 12 too, be not conformed. I can be conformed to it, but I'm not to be in it. Be not conformed to this world. Be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, I am not connected to it. I am a stranger, but I'm also a pilgrim. You know what a pilgrim means? This isn't my final destination. See, a pilgrim passes through. A pilgrim's on his way somewhere. A pilgrim, and we are in this world, we are pilgrims, we know that this world is not our home. He said, so I'm exhorting you, brethren, as strangers, as citizens, our expectation is that you wouldn't be connected to this world, but you've got to reach the world. Now, I'm going to just tell you, you're not going to reach the world by living like them. 
You're not going to impact the world when you talk just like they talk, dress just like they dress, entertain yourself the same way they entertain themselves. You know, if we hang out with the world, it's one thing to rub shoulders with them. We have to do that. We certainly ought not be isolationist. You know, the Bible says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Now, that's people that are immoral. But now, he also clarified it in the next verse. He said, but not all together with the fornicators of this world. You go back and look at the context of that passage, and you'll find that there was a claiming believer in the church who was in brazen immorality. He was exhorting, he said, this particular believer who claims to be a Christian, he says, you as a church need to separate yourself because they're affecting the testimony of the church. But he clarified. He said, but don't get that attitude about lost people. He says, you still got to know them, talk to them, be around them so you can reach them for Jesus. But he also says that we're not supposed to engage in their activity. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, evil communications corrupt good manners. Listen, I have to work with them. I have to be neighbors with them. And I say them, I'm talking about the lost world. I have to uh, be involved in extracurricular activities that they're around. My kids will play soccer. They're going to be on the field. If, if I'm going to go to a, a ball game, they may be sitting next. God would have us live in this world to influence them. But we're not to associate in the sense of becoming fast friends with folks that don't know Jesus. You say, well, if I really want an open door, and if I really want to get next to them and really witness to them, then I'll sit next to them at the bar. If I really want to get next to them, maybe I'll uh, be familiar with all of their different stuff they watch on television and movies and so forth. If you're like them, you're not going to impact them. After all, they're looking for something different. Now, Christians aren't perfect people, but we do want Jesus to live through us. And the age-old question of what would Jesus do certainly is pertinent. Now, if we're going to be strangers and pilgrims, that is, we have an expectation in our position, but also in our perception. How are we going to be viewed by this world? Well, I look again to the phrase that is used here in verse 12. He says, have your conversation honest. We talked about that. That whereas they speak evil against you as evil doers. And that they do. You know, the world, and I'm talking about not every person of the world, I'm talking about this system. You take the epitome of this world system, and what is it in our own culture in America? What is the epitome of the world system? It is the big media that we hear from. In other words, they are the amplification of what the world stands for. If you want to know the biggest thing going on in the culture, you listen to the media, and they'll tell you what, where the culture is coming from. If you want to know politically what their stance is on certain issues, listen to the big media. They're going to tell you. Now, I'm not saying every person in the big media is necessarily anti-God, but as, a, as an entity, they reflect this world, and this world is no friend to grace. This world is anti-God. So when I look at that and I see them calling us evildoers, it's not unexpected. You say, they call us evildoers? Listen, the true Bible-believing Christian who says there's one way to heaven, God has expectation for us to repent of our sin and turn to Jesus to be saved, we're basically considered a cancer. We're looked at as a, uh, somebody who's stopping their agenda. Now, they don't care if we believe how to be saved, but they think we're stopping their liberal agenda from going forward. And I'm not talking about just political liberalism. I'm talking about things that are opposed to this book. They call us evildoers. So do we just say, well, they're calling us evildoers. Boy, what can we do to make ourselves more palatable? No, we don't make ourselves more palatable. We make ourselves more like Jesus. Amen. And then notice what they're going to do. Now, God says this in the book. He says, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. He says in verse 15, for so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Now what does a Christian do to be perceived correctly by the world? You know the Bible says over in Matthew 5, 13, it says you are the salt of the earth, speaking to believers. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It's thenceforth good for nothing to be cast out, to be tread under the foot of men. In other words, if salt doesn't have any saltness, you might could walk on it to provide traction, but it doesn't do what it was intended to do. And you know, salt does a number of things. First of all, salt 
adds seasoning. What would this world be without a believer? You know, there wouldn't be any love if it wasn't for God loving the world. There wouldn't be any love. You want to go back and look pre-flood, see what the world looked like without any influence? That's what it looked like. Man was, the earth was filled with violence, and God had to destroy it. You know, salt also holds back corruption. I remember used to, when I worked in the um, meat department at the grocery store, the guy would go out and he would catch some, some meat before it went out of date, some of the pork, like picnics and spare ribs and stuff. It wouldn't sell because it was beginning to be a little bit out of date. He'd take it out and he would put it in a box of salt. And they would make corn spare ribs, corn picnics and so forth, and then wrap them back up and sell them at a price as a, as a corn picnic. And what happened is those, you could stick them out at room temperature after they sat in that box of salt and they wouldn't decay because the salt held back the corruption. It was a preservative. But you know what else salt does? Salt makes people thirsty. How many of you like country ham? I don't know what's wrong with the rest of you. But I'll tell you, as much as I love country ham, you know, sometimes if you forget, say we have some for supper, which I hadn't had any in a while, but uh, if, say, we have some for supper and you forget about it, you're sitting around at night about 9 o'clock and you go get a glass of water. Then about 30 minutes later, you're thinking, man, I am really thirsty. I need to get another glass of water. And you might even wake up at 1 o'clock in the morning and that's unusual and think, why am I so thirsty? And then it'll hit you. I had country ham for supper. Country ham will make you thirsty because it is full of salt. Now, you say, that stuff's going to kill you if you keep eating. you got to go some way, right? Amen? But anyway, <laughs> salt will make you thirsty. Now, do you realize Jesus said we are the salt of the earth? We hold back corruption. We add seasoning to life. But we also cause people to thirst to know who Jesus is. Now, we are supposed to be perceived by the world in a certain way. The world is not interested in ritual. It doesn't impress them that you have certain rituals. They're not interested in that. They, the thing that impacts a lost man who doesn't know a thing about this book, who just knows, hey, I'm empty on the inside. I don't have any peace. I don't have any direction. My life seems to be a wreck. That person has it all together. Why is it? Because you have a hope. That's something they, they can understand is hope. Now, he specifically deals here with submission to authority. And I need to touch on this because notice in verse 13, <clears throat> excuse me, they are beholding your good works at the same time calling you an evildoer. Now, notice in verse 13, he says, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Do you know the best citizen that you'll find is a Christian who wants to obey God? Because God says we're supposed to obey the government. Now, there is a authority structure. Obviously, I obey God first. In the book of Acts, the government told the disciples, stop preaching in Jesus' name, and they said, we ought to obey God rather than man. You know, we went through the COVID restrictions, and as far as we could obey COVID restrictions on the right road, we would, should do that as believers. But I think about those churches over in California who were told by their government, you cannot operate as a church. You can't operate the ordinance of a church. You can't operate the fellowship of a church. The world says, well, why don't you just have it on live stream all the time? You don't need to come. God told us to assemble together. You say, well, you're just a lawbreaker. Well, no, I have a higher authority. But on the other hand, it might be that the government puts something on me that is inconvenient, that I don't like, but not violated God's authority. In that case, as a Christian, I'm supposed to obey the law. I'm supposed to do what the law says because as a Christian, we're to submit ourselves. So here the world says, here's a bunch of evildoers that are causing trouble. Well, it just so happens we're the best citizens there are because we try to keep the law. You try to get by without keeping it. Christians aren't, uh, aren't uh, violators of tax codes and so forth. Christian, honest Christian doesn't try to cheat the government. You say, well, you're going to give that money to pay for stuff you don't agree with. But well, Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and the things that are unto God. Now, don't get me wrong. If they've put a loophole in there in the tax codes, I'll try to use it. I'll try to give them as little as I can. Um, if they got a way to keep from paying it, uh, I say, hey, keep as much as you can because they certainly don't know how to use it well. 
But when it comes to just blatantly violating the law, we don't violate the law as believers. Why? Because God ordained man to have law over man. I don't want to go into it in detail and get off the subject, but I think it's worth noting that back in Genesis chapter 9, when God destroyed the entire world with a flood, when Noah came off that ark, God said, man is evil from his youth. If I leave him to his own devices, he'll just simply do the same thing again. He'll kill each other off and I'll have to come and destroy the world. He said, I'm not going to destroy the world with a flood again. But in the meantime, I am going to let man govern himself. And he took the very highest epitome of authority and entrusted it to man. In Genesis chapter 9, he says, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, that is, they murder. Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man, shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. He said, here I am, God, with the author of life, and I'm going to entrust man when he comes together and creates a government to have the ability to do the epitome of taking a life when they violate law. Now, God inst instituted government. If God instituted it, as long as it doesn't violate what God tells me to do, I have a responsibility to keep it. Now, this idea of submission is going to come up later, and I'll deal with it in more detail. That is, on another week, if Jesus tarries. But certainly, right here, that's part of our testimony. Now, I notice not only our perception by the world, but what about our pursuit of the world? Look, if you would, down in verse 15. So is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Now what we have is a world that is ignorant and it's foolish. How are we to pursue that world? Do you see that God doesn't say we're strangers and pilgrims just kind of hang on to the end. One day I'm going to come take over this thing and you'll just hang on. It gets better after this. No, his implication is, look, you're going to be here as a stranger and a pilgrim. Yes, I could come at any moment, but right now your job is to go after the ignorant and the foolish. Now, when you see ignorant and foolish, the, the, the thought here is not that he's saying, hey, they're just a bunch of ignoramuses and they're fools. Leave them to their own devices. No, really, this is a term of pity. Ignorant really means they don't know any better. They're just uninformed. Foolish is saying, hey, they're simply simple. Do you realize as a, as a Christian, I look at this world. Here's somebody whose mind is blasted on drugs and alcohol. You could certainly ride by and say, boy, you made some terrible choices, and you've destroyed your life with it, and you're right. But you could also say, you know what, except for God's grace, I'd be the same way. I know the truth. Let me tell you the truth. You could look at somebody even in a, a lifestyle of, of debauch, debauchery like homosexuality. We know God's opposed to that. He's against it. But it's still a sin. A person may be ignorant. You don't know what in the world dread, uh, led them to that type of unbridled lust. But you know, without Jesus, who knows where we might be. They're ignorant and they're foolish but there's hope for them. They need Jesus. Here's a person who's maybe even uh, just had uh, destroyed his domestic life, maybe beat his wife or whatever, and we'd say, man, what a worthless individual. And yes, they are, and we're not going to excuse their sin. We're not going to say it's okay, but we'd say they're ignorant. They don't know the truth. Or maybe they knew it, and they don't realize what it would do for them. They're foolish. They're simple. Jesus saw the multitudes. Now, who did he look at? What's perhaps the Worst sin that's ever been recorded in the Bible is when folks said, crucify him, crucify him. He's looking at that same group that's going to say, crucify him, crucify him. And when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. You know why? Because they fainted and they were his sheep having no shepherd. Now, there's plenty of folks who are rebels against the truth. There's folks who've heard the gospel God's dealt in their heart and they said, no, God, I'll do as I please. Listen, we pray for them. God can still deal with them. They can still be saved. But there's a whole lot of folks out there that's life is just wrecked by sin because they're ignorant and simple and don't know what the gospel could do for them. Even if they've heard it, they're blinded to it. The devil's blinded their mind. So we pursue this world with a testimony. We're looking for an open door. Listen, I can knock on some person's door and I've never met them before. And I can say, if you die today, you know for sure you're going to heaven. Hey, they, I don't know what they've been through. God may have well providentially led me to that door. And he does this and he does lead us to people like that. But how much more when they've watched your life, they've seen your uh, testimony, they've, they've seen the hope that lies in you, 
there's going to even be more open doors if we live that kind of life for God. We've got to pursue this world. You see, there's a pursuit here. We've got a testimony for a reason. He said, be ye holy, for I am holy. You're a peculiar nation, a a chosen generation. Why? Because Jesus wants to pursue a lost world that they might come to know Jesus. That's the emphasis. Now think about today. How is the world viewing you? How are you perceived by the world? I don't know of any of us who wouldn't at some time say, boy, I really blew that in front of my coworkers. Man, that wasn't a great testimony in front of my kids. I probably, I wish my neighbors hadn't noticed that. I mean, all of us have made uh, mistakes in that way, in the way that we thought my testimony could have been better. But that don't mean you give up. That means you start saying, how can I be a testimony? Now, the, the emphasis that we're getting from this passage, again, talks about our expectation. What does God want us to do? He wants us to live as strangers and pilgrims. He wants us to pursue a lost world. But I want you to notice he also talks about our endurance. Now, what I mean by that is in verse 19. Notice it says, this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongly. Have you ever endured any grief? Have you ever suffered wrong? Well, how did you respond to it? He says in verse 20, what glory is it when you be buffeted for your faults and you take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it and you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. You know, the fact is in this world, sometimes you're going to get lied on. Sometimes you're going to be treated wrong. Sometimes you're going to see what you consider to be injustice in your life. He is telling these believers, he said, look, if it happens that you endure a problem, don't let it be because you caused it. He said, but even if you didn't cause it, you had nothing to do with it, and you do it, you endure it. Why? For conscience sake. There's two motivations that he gives here for for living for God in the midst of a world who doesn't appreciate it. You know, if you try to uh, reach a lost world, do you realize you're, you're trying to reach some folks who don't want to be reached? I mean, the world's not interested. If they were, there's a church, right? They can show up, come hear the gospel like anybody else can. I mean, we could just view it and say, well, they don't even want to hear it. I've tried to witness to them. They turn it down. So, hey, just uh, shake the dust of my feet off and, and leave and so forth. But you understand there's a bigger cause than just the world. The cause is our love for the Lord. You know, he even uses that phraseology right here in this passage. If you notice in verse 13, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. You know, we talked about following the law and submitting to the laws. It certainly isn't because I got so much trust in the politicians. I mean, it isn't because I look at the law and say, boy, if those guys are that smart and that honest and that upstanding and they make a law, I don't understand why, but boy, I better do what they say. Man, if that's the reason, we probably wouldn't want to obey any of them. But if we say, you know what, some of that stuff they do I don't like, but it doesn't violate my conscience, it doesn't violate the Word of God, I don't think it's necessary, but I'm going to do it for my testimony, for the Lord's sake. Now, you think about for a moment, and I won't turn you over there, you're probably familiar with the account, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the believers in that church were having disputes with one another. They were all part of the church. There was no other Christians that lived in Corinth. They all were the same congregation. They all knew each other. And they were having some difficulties. Perhaps one man had a, a, a property line in issue with his friend or whatever it might be. And they began to argue. And instead of settling it, they went to lawyers and went to the court. Out in the middle of the world. They were known in Corinth because Corinth was a wicked place. Those folks are supposed to be believers. Now they had other problems as well. But one thing he got on them about in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, why would you go to law with one another in front of of unbelievers. He says, do you try to do this in front of the world because you're overlooking something? You're overlooking that they're watching you. You know what his conclusion was? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, he says, why would you not rather suffer yourself to be defrauded? In other words, just allow you, what if you came out on the losing end? Suppose you settled this thing with your, with your believing friend, maybe it's a property line dispute, and he ended up with 10 more feet of your land and shouldn't have. Well, what would be worse than that if somebody died and went to hell because of your testimony? He said, just suffer yourself to be wronged. God can take care of this. You know, it takes faith to do that. 
Because the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. That doesn't mean I'll let watch back and watch God kill that person. No, you know what? God, whatever's right, I believe you're able to take care of it. And you settle it. Now, the testimony of those people was, was essential for the Lord's sake. But also for conscience sake. We got to keep our conscience today. You see, why do we want to do right? We want to do right because we want to make sure if we get buffeted for our faults, if we get talked bad about, at least we know we've done the right thing. You ever had anybody, maybe at your job, uh, try to imply that you weren't doing it well, that you were lazy, that you were taking extra time? They, uh, maybe it was a person, maybe you're higher up than they are, and, or maybe the boss likes you better or whatever, and they lie on you and, and, and impugn your character. That's, that's tough to take. But what he's saying is if that happens and you didn't have anything to do with it, he said... You simply take it patiently, which is hard to do. What you want to do is go act just like the world, lose your temper, have a bad response, lose your testimony, but I got that guy told anyway. But did it really help the cause of Christ? You know, the most important thing in our life as believers is the cause of the gospel, the cause of Christ. Sometimes you can just lose an argument that we might gain the war, and the war is against the devil. He's saying, take it patiently because this is acceptable with God. You know, I may, I may even walk away and some lost person may say, yeah, I got one over on him. Some lost person may say, yeah, I let him have it and he'll never, he can't do anything about it. But my humble response and my allowing my speech to be taken control of by God may be the very thing that somebody else is watching and is a testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, when it comes down to the uh, eternity, When it comes to the judgment seat of Christ, which one's going to matter the most? You know, the Bible says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer every man. God's concerned in how you speak. God's concerned in how you come across. God's concerned in how you differ from a lost world. So we have some expectations. God says that. He says that our endurance is certainly essential. But then ultimately, this is where we want to get to and close with, is verse 21, our example. It says, For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Now, everything he said previously, he just backs it up with the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. You want to talk about somebody who was suffered and who was reviled unjustly, that's the Lord Jesus. He was lied on. He had been brought up to a mockery of a trial. When he did, when it was all said and done, what did the Pharisees think? We got rid of him. We finally ended this thing. Man, isn't that something? They sat gleefully, the Bible says in Matthew 23, while he was hanging on the cross, blood dripping from his hand, Uh, beard pulled out by the roots. He's hanging, bleeding, and dying. It says, sitting down, they watched him there. Then they began to mock him. They said, if uh, you who uh, can destroy the temple in three days, why don't you come down from the cross? We'll believe you. Now, Jesus had power to come down from that cross, but he stayed on it. He committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. He said, there's a bigger plan going on. Do you really think Jesus sat up on the cross that day and thought, man, I hate these guys think they're getting away with this. I sure hate they think they're getting over with this. I ought to come down just for a minute and show them and then come back up here. Now, that's what I would do, and that's what you would do. Jesus looked down and saw lost people and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, he is our example. Several things about this example, and we could spend the whole time on this, I'm sure you're encouraged if I go another half hour. Amen? All right, here we go. But if you'll notice, first of all, his separation, verse 22. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Let me tell you that Jesus was a testimony. He is our example because he, you talk about living a holy life, he did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. You say, well, Jesus never condemned sin. You know, he just lived the life and he always spoke softly and uh, just didn't cause any kind of ruckus. Do you know Jesus is the one who said, if your hand defend thee, cut it off? 
It is better to enter into life maimed than having two hands to be cast into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Jesus didn't mind dealing with sin and telling you about the consequences. He came to the woman <clears throat> that was at the well. This woman had had five husbands, and the woman she was living with now was not her husband. And he said, woman, before you go any further, are you willing to get rid of your sin? And she says, well, I perceive you're a prophet. He says, it doesn't end there. Let me tell you how you can worship God. I have meat to eat. He told the woman that her sin was wrong, but she was impressed that he had a love for her soul. Well, he came to the, woman, uh, the man by the pool. The man had been healed. He carried up his bed. He came back to meet Jesus. And he said, now, sir, you've seen God do something in your life. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come on you. Jesus didn't mind dealing with sin, but how did he deal with it? He dealt with it in love. Ephesians 4.11, speaking the truth in love. He is our example of how you can live a holy life, but not wear it on your sleeve. You wear it on the pages of the scripture. You see, the truth in this book is impacting. We don't ever overlook sin. We don't excuse sin. We don't say uh, anything that God says is wrong. We say it's wrong. But you can have a sanctimonious, superior attitude when you deal with it, or you can look at it as a sinner who found hope and view it with love for others who hadn't found that hope. That's how Jesus did it. He was separated, but he was separated in the right approach. But you know, he also was submissive. You notice in verse 23, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. You know, he knew how to submit. He, he uh, was approached by the disciples, as I mentioned before, and they said, should we pay tribute? or the Pharisees, should we pay tribute to Caesar? I mean, he's wicked. He's ungodly. What are we going to do? Shouldn't we rebel against those people? He said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, unto God the things that are God. Do you know when he was 12 years old, and happened before this, but it was recorded that he was subject to his parents? Well, he created his parents, but God placed him there. And for that period of time, from the time he was born till he was a grown man, God providentially placed him in a parent's home, and Jesus, without hesitation, was subject to his parents. Can you imagine when his dad or mom were making some kind of decision? He's God. I mean, he had to think to themselves, I, boy, I could help you with this, but you're my parents. I mean, he had to be able to look at it and say, you know, Joseph's over here trying to figure out a problem, how he can build this cabinet he's building, and Jesus could have said, man, I could build that cabinet in half the time because I know how to do it, or he could have, I'd just do that and make it. Now, I'm being a little facetious, but you understand God being subject to his parents? Well, you know, there might be some folks you work for that you're smarter than. There might be some, uh, even some kids that are smarter than their parents. A lot of them think they are. There might be some uh, uh, folks who think that they know more than the government knows. That wouldn't take much. Uh, but the fact is, it doesn't matter what you know or how good you are. If God has placed us in a providential position, just like Jesus, he says he's our example. He was subject, subject to his parents, subject to the government. But at the same time, ultimately, he said, I came to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Listen, I don't follow necessarily a, a person I'm subjected to. And the, the passage goes on to talk about slave masters and the government and so forth. He didn't do that because he was, had such respect. He did it because it was right for conscience sake. He's our great example. So he's an example in separation, an example in submission, and finally, <clears throat> an example in suffering. Notice if you would in verse 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Now, perhaps you have suffered wrong. Perhaps you had somebody who did you wrong, and you want to pay them back. You want to lose your temper. You want to respond. Jesus is our great example. It says, let this mind be in you, Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you, which also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, who, being in found in fashion as a man, humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus went to a cross. Men mocked him, 
pulled his beard out by the roots, spat in his face. He could have prayed the Father. He said, could I pray the Father and, and call down 12 legions of an, uh, angels? He could have just said, this is it, I'm done. But he submitted himself, and then he took your sin. He was a sinless son of God. He bore your ungodliness that you might be able to make, be made righteousness. That's the example of submission. That's the example of suffering. And yet that Savior, the one who did this, if you know him today, lives in you. And if you surrender to him, you say, I don't know if I could be that kind of testimony. You're correct. But if you surrender to him, he can be that kind of testimony through you that we might impact the world. Let's have a word of prayer. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed and no one's looking around. Perhaps you're here today and maybe you don't know the Lord Jesus personally. You may be searching.